miracles always uh, happen to have occurred and is happening now. So one question I've never asked him, Brooks, whether he believes in the hollow earth theory. He might have seen it. Uh, it, that, you know, it's interesting. We look at uh, satellite data as much as we can get our hands on, and the poles, for some reason, are covered with a very thick cloud cover most of the time. Most of the time, that's true. Even the 1968 photos, which which had to be pieced together like a pie uh, uh, when they were stitched together, and mind you, this is film, not digital. Uh, and, of course, there's a large void in the middle where the core of these pictures are put together. There's cloud cover going as far back as 1968. The only way to see it by air is to fly under 4,000 feet, which Admiral Byrd did. Hence, he's an aviation hero instead of a statistic. But we can't get a pilot today to fly a jet under 4,000 feet. They won't do it. So the only way there is by sea. And this is the first expedition of its kind. If the hole is there, how far down do you think it goes? Does it go all the way through? I've seen drawings that this planet looks almost like there are two pieces to it, and it's not totally connected. Well, that's because you're you're looking at it on a flat piece of paper. Okay. What you need to look at it is like a like an orange that has a, a small hole in the top and a small hole in the bottom. And then there's a void between the skin and the core of the orange. So it's difficult to draw on paper. Uh, so what you're seeing is a cutaway of the hollow earth. If the continents, and this is another really excellent piece of data, the continents of earth fit together exactly like, like a key and a lock all the way around the planet. Mm -hmm. And not the, the, the shoreline that you see, but the continental shelves that are beyond the shoreline. Like, a, really, pu like a puzzle. Yes. And it, when you fit them together, the Earth is one-third its present size. So if you triple the diameter of the planet, then there's got to be a void between the core and the crust. And I'm looking at some data from the University of Illinois that was recently published, and we've got it posted on our website at phoenixsciencefoundation.org. Incredibly, they have... Uh, measured using really uh, excellent seismology, a solid core of iron crystal, which is much, much more dense than regular iron, which makes a lot of sense since even if we take the density of our current crust, which we've only bored into at about three or four miles. In fact, the deepest hole in the world is being bored in Russia right now, and it's going to go to 40,000 feet. We just uh, shipped 15 uh, shipping containers of lubricant up there, so I know how deep that hole is. Um, that's that's a, a, a barely scratching the surface of our planet, George. We're talking a crust 800 miles thick. Can you imagine, if you find this, what it would do to science? Well, hopefully it would do the same thing that the discovery the Earth was round did. Yeah, probably even more so, because it opens up the question of what else is there. Sure. I mean, if you think that the Earth is being visited by ETs and has been visited for a long, long time, what is it, 60-something percent of the country has actually seen a UFO? Where do they park? Where do they stay when they're here? They don't go back out into space and then come in for a brief visit and then leave again. They've got a home here somewhere. And it could be right there in the hollow Earth. Very well could be. Lots of legends say it is. Brooks, uh, we're going to spend the rest of the program talking with you about your latest work, The Ark of Millions of Years. Uh, before we get to the commercial break here, give us an overview of this. Well, this is the third book and final book in the trilogy. When we originally wrote The Ark of Millions of Years, Volume 1, it was just under a 1,000 pages. Our publisher said, no, cut it in half. So we did, and we released that book, and it, I don't know, it jumped up to number 48 on Amazon. It was amazing. Then the second book came out 13 months later. This book ties the three books together. So you've got the complete end times uh, analysis from a religious standpoint, from a historical standpoint, and also from a scientific standpoint, all in, in three books. Now, the last part of the book, it's, it's a part two, actually, is called unlocking the secret because when we got finished with the end times books there was so much doom and gloom in it we just had to have a message of hope at the end of Good. it 
So uh, there was a recent uh, publication called The Secret. It came out. It, it enjoyed magnificent marketing, and lots of people took advantage of it. But it was missing the tools, the, the math, and everything was missing from it. So uh, I decided to take a look at it uh, mathematically and from a physics point of view, and we actually discovered the physics of the soul in this, and we put it in the book. The last 125 pages are a stunning uh, a paternal way to look at the law of attraction. And it, uh, it has nothing to do with metaphysics. It's all science. It's all mathematics. And we've proven it over and over again that it works. How do you tie it into 2012? Well, the Mayans originally had a mathematic calendar, and it was built, we believe, using the Tolkien wheels. The Tolkien wheels were, it is believed, fashioned either by Abraham or were given to Abraham and were used to very accurately uh, tell time in multiple dimensions. So accurate was this calendar that even uh, Moctezuma knew when Cortez was going to arrive, what he was going to be sailing, and why he would arrive. Well, this date now, December 21st, 2012, where so many people have come up with so many different kinds of theories, as, as you look at it, we're going to get into it tonight. You have made an incredible, incredible glance at global warming, regardless of its causes, and you somehow... Tied into the Mayan end time. Yes. Uh, what happens is, as the solar system in our part of the galaxy goes through the zodiac, uh, the axis that goes through the center of the Earth actually draws a circle in the zodiac. We're coming to the end of the age of Pisces, and we're getting ready to start the age of Aquarius. Mm -hmm. This is the, shall we say, uh, 11 o'clock position of the Mayan calendar. That is to say, it's the end of the age that was originally uh, quoted by Christ, by uh, uh, Muhammad, by several other prophets. This is the end of the age. What it means is that this solar system is arriving at a place in our galaxy where it lines up with the rift in the galaxy, which it's believed is a corridor that leads directly to the black hole, a, a supermassive revolving black hole at the center of our galaxy. That alignment is going to energize a lot of things in our planet, and it's going to cause the two phases of matter that make up the Earth, and, and we discussed that from the first volume, to separate. It's also going to cause all the planets in our solar system to warm, and they are all doing it. And it's starting. It is starting. So to me, the 2012 date may not be the beginning, may not be the end, but we're in that time period right now. Yes, and, and it's not like, two, you know, December 21st, the lights turn on. Right. It's a gradual warming. Uh, in the last 19 years, we've had a satellite called Cassini going around uh, Saturn. Mm -hmm. We've been monitoring its things like atmospheric pressure and spectrum. In the last 18 years, the atmospheric pressure of Saturn has gone up a staggering 30%. If that happened on Earth, uh, there would be no life left on this planet. Fortunately, we don't react like that. But you know, on our planet, the rearrangement of temperature spectrums across our planet is melting the North Pole, freezing the South Pole, moving the Gulf Stream around, changing weather patterns, and it's really going to, in, a, in the next five years, take some radical right-hand turns, and we are going to have to adapt as a species. More to come in a moment on Coast to Coast AM. I'm going to talk a lot with Brooks Agnew about Earth changes, the Mayan calendar, end time, his work, the arc of millions of years. Matter of fact, you might want to get up to his website and take a look at uh, some of the work. And uh, Edgar Casey once said that North America would have drastic changes. We'll also get Brooks' a take on that when we come back. Brooks, how do you think the Mayans knew this? They knew of the changes to occur. Wow, that's really a great question. Uh, it there is a lot of evidence in their artwork, not just the Mayan calendar, that indicates they were visited by, the, in our records, at least in what we were able to find, they were called the Shining Ones. Um, these were highly advanced beings that visited them, gave them a complex language ready to go, 
uh, taught them how to plant, taught them husbandry, taught them 